Hello everyone, this is Terry Erzman. I'm the Chief Marketing Officer for Percona. Welcome to today's webinar. Glad to have you here. Um, before we get started, uh, a little housekeeping. Uh, first of all, if you can hear me, please raise your hand in the GoToWebinar control panel. Great, I see a lot of uh, hands raised there. Thank you very much for doing that. Uh, we will be making a recording of today's webinar and we'll email a link to uh, everyone who's registered within 24 hours with uh, with both the uh, uh, a link both to the re recording of the webinar as well as to the slides that are uh, used today. So uh, look for that in your email. Uh, if you have any questions during the webinar today, please enter them in the questions panel in the GoToWebinar uh, uh, control panel, and we'll answer as many of those as we can at the end. If you have uh, questions we don't get to, uh, if possible, we'll uh, try and answer those in a blog post on the MySQL Performance blog as well. So with that, I would like to um, welcome our presenter for today, Stefan Kambandan, who uh, will speak on avoiding common traps when designing a MySQL application. Stefan, I turn it over to you. Thanks, Terry. Uh, hi everyone. So today we're going to have a look at uh, where you can make a mistake uh, when you design or run a MySQL application. So the, the, the first topic of, of today will be um, architecture for scaling. So let's say you have an application and um, you're quite successful and you want your, your MySQL database to scale. What should you do? Um, some people may tell you, well, you must shard your, your database. And um, actually, that may not be the, the best thing to do. Um, sharding is really a good solution, but only if uh, a single server, so a single database server, is not able to handle um, the, right, the right workload. Okay, so um, if a single server is not able to, to handle the load, the right load, basically you have two solutions. The first one is to ask your customers uh, not use the application uh, so much, which of course is not very good. And the second one is to try to build um, independent clusters for your application, and this is sharding. But um, it adds a lot of complications. So if you can avoid it, usually it's much, much better. Um, and you have uh, many different ways to cope with uh, scaling. Uh, for instance, let's say you have an application where you have um, an e-commerce website and you have a forum. Both applications are clearly independent, so you can have one database server for the e-commerce website and another one for the forum. And um, you, if, this way you will be able to split the right load without charting. So that's, some, that's a technique we sometimes call functional partitioning and it can be really, really efficient. And as you may know, um, for, for most people using MySQL, they're using it in the context of a web application. And for web application applications, um, the main goal is to be able to scale the reads. And to scale the reads, a really good solution is to use the native MySQL replication. Um, and what, one thing to, to know uh, about sharding is that not every application is easy to shard. Uh, when, when you want to shard an application, you will end up having uh, different independent uh, instances of your database. And it's very difficult to, um, to do cross-shard queries. So if your application has to do that, it's really not a good candidate for sharding. And above all, um, you, you want to look at um, a simple architecture, okay? So, so something that is good for Facebook, for instance, may not be good for you because you don't have the same scale. So if you, if you read a blog post, um, if you attend a conference and you see people saying, okay, we use this technique and it's really, really efficient, um, maybe you should ask yourself, 
uh, do I have the same size as they have, okay? And keep in mind that the operations are much cheaper if the architecture is simple, okay? So let's now see typical uh, replication topologies. So the first one is master master. Um, it's really a great cheap way to improve uh, high availability. Uh, in itself, it's not a high availability solution, but it, it can improve it. So. Um, keep in mind that it doesn't improve write capacity, okay? Because um, if you have master master replication, all the the writes that you that you can write on a master in parallel will be serialized through replication, so it doesn't improve write capacity. And um, a very important, never write on both masters, because it's really the best recipe for disaster. Um, apart from that, the standard setup for scaling is to use one master and many slaves. So it's a very good solution to scale a read mostly application because you, you're most likely to be able to offload most of the reads to the slaves. And uh, setting up replication, my setting up MySQL replication is really easy. So it's, it's really the, the, the solution uh, that most people are using. But be aware that um, even with this standard and uh, simple setup, you can have some complications. Um, for instance, let's look at the, the picture on the on the left side. So you have uh, your application, you're writing to the master, and um, you can read, uh, you, 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 you perform most of the reads on the slave, slave one or slave two. And then on the right, uh, the master crashes. So now you, you're not able um, your, your application is not able to write to the database. So what do you want to do? You want to promote one of the slaves. Let's say you want to promote S1. If you do that, well, that's not enough because now your application is able to read and write to S1, but S2, um, it doesn't get any update from S1, okay, because S2 was configured as a slave from the master. So if you promote S1, you'll have to perform an extra step, which is set up replication from S1 to S2. So this is something to keep in mind because it's not impossible to do, but uh, if you have to do that at 3 a.m. or if you have to do that um, at peak time when you have high pressure, it, it's not that easy, okay? So to help you, you can try to rely on tools uh, to help you promote a slave and uh, reconfigure application. So a tool can be anything ranging from um, a well-documented procedure uh, with steps that you will execute manually to more automated tools like MHA or PRM. Um, it's really up to you to decide what is the best solution for you. Second topic, configuration. So <clears throat> here, um, re really one of the most common mistakes that, uh, that is made is to keep the, the default my.cnf file. So you, you probably know that um, until uh, MySQL 5.6, you had some sample files um, that were not very good. For instance, you have the myhuge.cnf uh, where you, you you can see that um, a good size for your uh, InnoDB buffer pool is two gigabytes. And of course, that may be a good size for your uh, laptop, but for your server, it's probably too too small. So keeping the default myhuge.cnf is really not so good. But in the opposite, if you spend uh, days or weeks to try to fine-tune every setting, uh, you will waste a lot of time. Because um, I don't remember exactly the number of settings that you have, but I think in 5.6 you have 350 per parameters, maybe 400. Of course, all of them are not useful for you. So you should 
spend some time on the most important one and we'll see um, in the next slide that only five to ten uh, settings are really important and for the rest leave them as a default and if you have problems investigate and then you, you'll be able to adjust them to better uh, values. Um, another trap is to do Google tuning so uh, you want to know what's the best configuration for, um, for, for some setting you, uh, you search in Google and you find someone uh, who in 1999 set the value to something and of course uh, something that was true in 1999 may not be true uh, today so it's always difficult to, to know if um, something that you find on, on the internet is really uh, relevant for you. Another common mistake um, is to try to um, um, to, to, to change the, the settings in an automated way. So, for instance, I'm buying a new server, it's twice powerful as the, the older one, so I will double the value of all of my settings. Well, it, it doesn't make sense. Uh, to, to, to begin, uh, what does it mean twice powerful hardware? I don't know. And um, in, in, in a more general um, way, bigger is not always better. So for some uh, settings, if, for instance, with memory, if you over allocate memory, uh, you can run into trouble. If you're running short of memory, you may crash your server, your MySQL server, or even your world server, and of course, it will be very bad. And finally, um, on the configuration, one thing that sometimes uh, people or people do is to change 10 settings at a time. So they change their my.cnf, they change 10, 10 settings, they restart the server, they look at the performance, say, oh no, it's bad. But what was the problem? Was it setting 1, setting 8? We don't know. So we're back to step 1. So the, the, the best solution when you want to um, tune your configuration file is to change one setting at a time and to see if um, you, you can have some benefit from the change or not. And if, um, if you do one of these, um, if you make one of these mistakes, uh, you'll probably have performance problem, you'll probably have instability, your server may crash sometimes, uh, whereas you, you don't know wh what is going on, and of course it leads to uh, frustration. So, um, what do you need to configure uh, in, in, for, your, for your MySQL server? Well, if you're using InnoDB, and I suppose you, you're using InnoDB, uh, there are only two very important settings. The first one is the size of the buffer pool. So the buffer pool is the main cache for data and indexes. And um, yeah, the basic rule is uh, it should be um, it should be large, or very large. Okay, if you can fit all your data in memory, of course, uh, it's good. Okay, and the second important uh, setting is the size of the redo log. So the InnoDB log file size. Um, this setting is really important for write performance. So sometimes um, we have customers that have um, stalls in their uh, MySQL performance and it's basically uh, due to um, the fact that, that their redo logs are too small and InnoDB is not able to cope with the write load. So sometimes it has to stall everything to um, clean up the situation and of course it's very bad for performance. So just increasing the size of the redo logs can make performance more stable. Um, a, a, third, a third setting that can be uh, nice to have but really it's not mandatory, it's the InnoDB file per table. Um, it allows you to have a table space uh, per table instead of having one huge table space uh, that is shared 
by all the tables. Uh, it's really good because you can reclaim space when you drop or truncate a table. And um, you, if, if you have many small tables, um, it's usually easier to manage many small files uh, instead of one very big file that can be 800 gigabytes or so. Um, what else is, uh, is important? Disabling the create cache. So it's not 100% true, but I think in most cases uh, disabling the, the create cache is very good. So you can, you, but by default, what we um, usually recommend is that you disable the create cache until you can prove that the create cache is beneficial. And uh, it's really, really difficult to prove that the create cache is beneficial. So it has a lot of uh, scalability problems. And uh, it's very uncommon that uh, it, is very, it is beneficial for, for your workload. So first, try to disable it. And uh, well, basically, it, it's done. So that's not very hard to have a um, robust and um, a, a, a good basis for your, for your configuration. Then if you want to go a bit further, you have some settings that are not very easy to configure and that can be helpful. For instance, you can configure uh, the durability mode of InnoDB with InnoDB flush log at transaction commits. So here you can choose between uh, the default setting, which is one, meaning uh, InnoDB runs in full durability mode, so your data is safe, but of course it's um, the slowest mode. Or you can have settings like zero or two, uh, that means uh, that, mean the, that um, InnoDB will run faster, but your data is not 100% safe. So of course the, the, the right setting depends on um, what you prefer, safety of data safety or, or speed. Um, sync bin log is a very popular setting. So it, um, it tells how to flush the, the bin log uh, to disk. So if you want the bin log to be uh, flushed at, is, at each commit, which is the, the safest value, use sync bin log equals one. Um, if you don't mind, you can keep the default value, which is sync bin log equals zero. Some other um, useful parameters that are very easy to configure, uh, the table cache, the thread cache, the max connections setting, and uh, skip name resolve, which is a setting um, allowing you to disable DNS lookups, which is always a good thing not to, to rely on, on DNS. Some other settings uh, should really not be configured. For instance, you have um, specialized buffers such as the sort buffer size, the join buffer size, the read random buffer size, etc. Uh, you will see many, many articles on the internet uh, telling you that um, you should increase the size, uh, which by default is something like one megabyte to 50 megabyte, 200 megabyte, etc. Please don't do it. It's it's really not a good idea. The, the, the first reason is um, because these buffers are per session buffer. So if you're very unlucky, um, if you have 1,000 connection, each connection using uh, the maximum size of a buffer, well, it can amount to tens of gigabytes of memory if the buffers are set uh, with a value that is too high. So it can exhaust your memory. It's bad, okay? And the default value, uh, it's really good for nearly 100% of, of the applications. So if you don't know what, you, what you're doing, don't, don't change the value of these buffers. Uh, the same for some esoteric settings uh, that many people don't really know how to, uh, how, how, wh what they control. And 
sometimes you can find a reference to uh, settings that are not used anymore, such as the master host or master user for uh, setting up replication in the my.cnf file. Or sometimes you have uh, settings like thread concurrency, uh, which looks like a useful setting, but it's only useful on Solaris, if I remember well. So if you don't use Solaris, well, don't spend time tuning a thread concurrency. Now, um, if you have master and slave, uh, what should you do with your configuration file? The basic idea is that if you have, if you have the same hardware for master and slaves, the configuration should be the same or approximately the same. On, on the slaves, you can take some shortcuts uh, to uh, prefer performance over data safety. So for instance, you can disable uh, binary logging. You can have a relaxed InnoDB durability. Um, and you can set the read-only parameter uh, to avoid accidental writes. Okay, so it's not a 100% guarantee that uh, you won't have any write, uh, direct write on, on the slave, but it's, it, it's quite good. Of course, if you want to promote a slave to become the new master, uh, don't forget to change the configuration to reflect that the slave is now a master, so it should have binary logging, etc., etc. Now let's look at um, the schema. So when you want to design your tables, um, you want to avoid a design uh, that will kill your performance. And um, we often see two designs that um, are not bad by, uh, by per, per se, but um, when they're misused, they, they, they lead to really bad performance. So the first one is the e-blob design, uh, that is um, store everything in a blob column. So use MySQL as a NoSQL solution. You can do that for some specific part of your application, but if the, your, your whole application is designed um, with eBlob, well, it, it, it won't probably scale very well. And the same is true for uh, the EAV, the Entity Attribute Value Design. It can be useful, but again, um, if you want to have millions of records and um, tens of thousands of reads per second, it may be difficult, okay? And what about normalization? Is it a performance killer? Um, many people will tell you that normalization is really bad. Why? Because it increases the number of joins. And if you have uh, more joins, you will have more random operations. And um, I suppose you know that uh, um, hard drives are really bad at random operations. So if you, if you normalize, you will have random operations, so your application will be slow. Okay, um, that's true, but it's only part of the picture, so that's true only for some specific spots um, in some applications, not every application. So now, um, normalization versus denormalization. What should we do? Um, what I suggest is to first try to normalize your schema and index it, index your, your columns correctly. It's very important to have good indexing when you're using a normalized schema because um, normalization relies on indexing to have good performance because of the random reads. Um, we'll talk about uh, indexes later, but uh, be, be aware that indexes can do many things. Of course, they can filter, so they can be useful when you have a work condition. They can also sort, so they can be useful to solve order by, an order by clause. And they can also cover a, quer a query. So 
covering a query means um, looking only at the index and not uh, having to look at the data to 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 get the results. And the, the the key thing here is that an index can filter, sort, and cover. If this is an end and not an or, so if you can design your indexes to do um, two or three operations uh, at the same time, it will be even better. And um, I've said earlier that normalization increases the number of random operations. But well, if you have, um, if you're able to use SSDs, random IOPS uh, is not really a, a, a problem anymore. Okay, so uh, it can be a really good solution to uh, mitigate the problem of the, the random operations. But even if you have uh, correctly normalized your schema and correctly indexed your uh, columns, sometimes some query will, will become slow. For instance, you can have uh, some combinations of filtering and sorting that can never be solved efficiently with an index. Uh, for instance, if you have a join um, and you want to order by a column in the first table and a column in the second table, you won't be able to use an index uh, to solve the to to to, to sort. So you will have to um, uh, to do a file sort, which is an external sort uh, made after um, the rows have been fetched, and it can be costly. And for some queries, you you will have to do uh, you will have to read lots of data. For instance, um, if you uh, run queries like count star or group by queries. So in this case, denormalizing can be a good solution. So denormalizing, creating summary tables, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Some of your useful tips when designing the structure of your table. Don't be too generous when sizing. Um, Many people think that there is no difference between a voucher 10 and a voucher 255. That's not true, because when um, the column is used for an, impl an implicit temporary table, MySQL will use the wall size of the column. And um, using um, data types that are too, too big, can make your uh, temporary tables go to disk instead of being uh, kept in memory. So when you can use tiny int, small int, or medium ints instead of ints and use small vouchers instead of the default voucher 255. Um, for InnoDB, the primary key is really important. Um, it holds the data it is called a clustering index, so it's good if you set a primary key explicitly. Explicitly, if you don't do that, InnoDB will create an, an implicit primary key for you. So, do do, do it. Do, uh, create a primary key explicitly, and um, it's good to know that the primary key is implicitly included in all secondary keys. So, uh, please keep your primary keys as short as possible. Okay, so for instance, um, a UUID is not a, a good solution or a, a char uh, 100 is not a, re a good solution for primary key. If you don't know what to use as a primary key for InnoDB, use an integer with an auto, an auto increment and it's, it's quite good. Let's now see um, a common problem that you, you, may, you may face. Um, let's see we're running um, a social network and we want to design the user table for, um, for, for our application. So to begin, we'll have um, an, identity, an, an ID, the user ID, and we'll uh, create the login and the password. And that's it. Of course, over time, 
uh, you want you will want to add um, the phone number, the address, um, an email address, etc., etc., and the, the, some uh, preferences like uh, is admin, uh, is premium, etc., etc. So each time you will have to uh, run an alter table, and um, with the number of users increasing, it will be um, um, more and more difficult to run alter table. Uh, it will be slow, it will be difficult to run, and you will have fragmentation in your table, and your table will become grow, or will become uh, very big. So all your queries against the table will be slow. What can you do? One solution, um, if you want to have lots of preferences, is to create a new table, which is here on the, on the right, user info. So it's um, a table when, where you will register um, all the, the preferences. For instance, uh, as I said, is admin, um, is premium, is deleted, etc., etc. And when you want to uh, to say that um, a user is active, you only have to uh, insert a row in the user has info table. So it's a standard many-to-many -many relationship. Um, and now the, um, the the adding a property is really easy. And it's very generic. So every time you want to add a property, you don't need to uh, run an alter table. Um, you don't need to write custom mode. That's really great. So is it a really such a good solution? Well, it it has drawbacks. For instance, the user as info table will not scale well because we can um, suppose that every user will have maybe tens of preferences, so tens of rows in this table. And so um, the, the, the user table won't grow um, um, as quickly as before, but the user as info uh, will grow very, very quickly. So it's, it's a very simple table with only two integers, but if it has one billion rows, of course it will be grow. It will be it will be big, um, and some queries are really difficult to write efficiently with this design. For instance, if you want to have the list of the users not having the property X, well, it's not it's not really easy to do. So in this situation, um, the, the the correct uh, solution is probably in the middle. So. Um, some of the properties can, <coughs> sorry, can go to the user table. Some properties can go to the user info table using the design uh, I presented earlier. And sometimes for over uh, columns or preferences, you will need to uh, create dedicated tables. And of course, as your application grows, you will have um, hotspots. For, for some tables, so we have to deal. You will have to deal with such situation, and you you will have to create something that is very specific for your application. Um, next topic: the queries. It is very common to um, to to have customers that say, "Oh, um, we have uh, queries that are slow, but." Um, yeah, what can we what can we do? We are uh, thinking of uh, changing the hardware, buying more RAM. Is it the best solution? Well, it can be a good solution, but it's not always uh, the best one. First, um, the cost. Uh, sometimes adding RAM can be very expensive, or buying SSD it can be very expensive. Sometimes you're hitting the physical limit of your hardware. If you're limited to uh, 192 gigabytes of RAM, and you already have 192 gigabytes of RAM in your machine. Well, you you will have to to change the machine, and it's it's much more complicated. Sometimes, um, if you buy more powerful hardware, um, you will discover contentions in MySQL. 
So um, the benefit of having better hardware is very limited. And something, the problem is not in the queries. Uh, so sometimes you know, the problem is that you're waiting for something that is external to the database. So here, buying more hardware for the database really will not help. So let's say now that you want to improve your queries. The first question is, what does it mean improving the queries? Improving basically means improving the response time. So your only goal when you want to improve the queries is to improve the response time. It's not to improve the execution plan, for instance. Uh, the only thing the end user cares about is the response time, not the execution plan. So you want a response time that is low and stable. The stability is something that is often uh, overlooked, okay, but it's really important for users to um, have an application where each time you go to the same page, um, it loads approximately in the same time. It's really frustrating when you go to uh, an application and sometimes the page loads in half a second and sometimes in five seconds. So how to make a query run faster? It's quite straightforward. The first part is to remove the unnecessary work, and the second part is to run the necessary work as efficiently as possible. So how to remove unnecessary, unnecessary work? Uh, first, by selecting only columns and only rows that you really need. So use limits. If you're only interested in the top results. Um, don't use select star um, except for some situations and try to use uh, caching. Uh, the, the goal of caching is to, um, to, 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 to avoid running some queries. The, the idea here is the fastest query is always the query that you don't run. And now, if, you, if you're able to uh, remove all the unnecessary work, uh, you want to optimize uh, the necessary work. So, a, go a, good, a, good, uh, a good thing to know um, is how to, um, uh, how to interpret the, the, the output of the explain comment. Okay, so explain is a really good tool to have lots of information on how the server uh, will execute your query. For instance, a very interesting information in explain is the type column. Um, it, it shows you how MySQL um, will access data and not all access types are equal. For instance, if you see index or all, meaning that you will have an index scan a full index scan or a full table scan, it's probably very bad. Uh, some index are missing. Sometimes the right solution is to rewrite the queries. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's very well known that uh, subqueries may perform very badly in MySQL, so sometimes rewriting a subquery to a uh, join uh, can be very beneficial. The situation is much better in MySQL 5.6 and in the new versions of uh, MariaDB, for instance, uh, but if you're running an old version of MySQL, well, looking at the subqueries and trying to rewrite them can, ben, can, be, can be very uh, beneficial. And sometimes switching from um, left join to inner join, if possible, can be beneficial. Uh, left join um, doesn't allow the optimizer to do um, some of the optimization that are uh, possible with inner join, so sometimes it can be a good, uh, good thing to, to change. And of course, when we are talking about uh, queries, query performance, we are talking about indexing. Uh, correct indexing is a key to good performance. And it's not it's not easy at all because um, if you um, if you have 
too few indexes, your performance will be bad. But if you have too many indexes, well, the performance may be bad too. So you will have to look for trade-offs between too many uh, and too few. Some tools that can help you, um, PT Duplicate Key Checker from Procona Toolkit. It can help you find duplicate indexes uh, that are indexes that you can, uh, in general, safely remove. You can use PT Query Digest to find the slow queries, and then um, looking at the execution plan, uh, you can try to add or uh, modify existing indexes. And you have a really nice feature in MariaDB and Procona Server, which is the user statistics. And it can um, help you identify uh, useless indexes. So with this feature, you will be able to count the number of time um, an index has been, uh, a row has been read in an index. And you can see if an index is really useful for, for your application with your data. Um, now we're going to talk about hardware. So, in short, um, a good choice with MySQL is to use commodity hardware. Uh, commodity hardware doesn't mean you will have to run MySQL on your laptop. Of course, you can have powerful hardware with while still being commodity. Um, one thing to know, for instance, um, for, for uh, your choice of CPU, is that MySQL is not able to um, to run a single query uh, with several cores. Okay, so it, it uh, MySQL doesn't allow parallel execution. So usually you want to have fast CPUs if you want to have fast response times. Um, a common mistake is to um, is to consider that you won't be able to scale MySQL uh, above four or eight cores. Uh, it used to be true with MySQL 5.0, for instance, but uh, the situation has greatly improved. So now, 24 cores, 32 cores, or maybe more, uh, it, it, it runs fine. It runs fine. For the memory, um, well, as all the database server servers, uh, MySQL uses RAM to cache indexes or and data. Uh, it uses RAM for uh, its internal buffers, so of course you want to have um, a large amount of RAM in your server. If possible, um, you want to have your working set uh, to be cached in memory, so every, uh, every operation will be done in memory, so of course it will be fast. But the question is, of course, what is the working set. The so working set is the, the fraction of data that is accessed frequently. Sometimes it's 100% of your data, sometimes it's only 1% of your data. Um, you don't have any tool at the moment to estimate the working set automatically, so um, it requires knowledge of the application. But it's really useful to, to know uh, what is your is your working set? Disks now. Um, I suppose you know that um, the world is moving to flash uh, because um, f flash storage um, al allows you to have much more uh, IOPS, especially random IOPS, and the latency is uh, lower than with uh, traditional hard drives. So you have. SLC, uh, you have SLC, you have MLC, etc. Um, sometimes you you may need to update your configuration file to take advantage of uh, flash storage, um, because of course MySQL uh, was developed at a time when uh, flash didn't exist. So by default, sometimes uh, some settings are set. Uh, considering that, of course, you you have a traditional hard drive, and if you have flash, you 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 should um, 
change some of the of the settings. So it's it's possible um, with Okona server and MariaDB. Um, with MySQL until 5.5 it was quite difficult, but with 5.6 uh, it's, it's, it's really being uh, much better. So a deeper look into flash technologies. So you have SSDs and you have the PCIe's, PCIe devices. So the, 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 the SSDs are really drop-in replacements uh, for HDDs. So it's really easy to use. Um, you will need um, to use RAID probably, like you're using for your uh, hard drives. If you're using uh, PCIe devices like um, Fusion IO, etc., uh, the performance will be even better. Um, but of course, the, the cost is um, is even bigger, and um, it, it can be a bit more difficult to um, to run at the beginning. Um, Let's let's now see uh, how you can mix uh, flash and hard drives. Sometimes a good configuration is to have flash for hot data and uh, traditional hard drives for archives. So flash for uh, low latency, uh, high number of high ups of IOPS, and traditional hard drives for uh, capacity storage. Sometimes you want to have uh, flash for data files and uh, traditional hard drives for the redo logs, the InnoDB redo logs, because the, in, with the redo logs you're only performing sequential writes and traditional hard drives are really good at uh, sequential writes, no need to use flash there. Um, should you prefer uh, more RAM or, um, or flash? Well. Uh, very often, more RAM is the best solution, but sometimes it's not. For instance, if the amount of RAM uh, you can add is limited, of course, and uh, if you have a high throughput uh, write load, because the, the, the having more RAM will delay the writes to the disks, but of course you won't be able to delay the writes forever. So you want the writes to be run as fast as possible, and SSDs will be good at it. Um, now, hardware for master and slaves. Some things to keep in mind: if you if you have a slave, um, the, the the replication is the replication thread. Uh, replication is, is single threaded, so um, a slave must be able to keep up with the master as a write, write load and it should be um, it, sh it should be powerful okay and if you promote a slave it should be at least as powerful as the master so one common choice is to have the same hardware for the master and for every slave and sometimes um, when the slaves are, are not really loaded you can use new hardware for the master and um, the master's old hardware for the slave. And sometimes uh, you want to use flash for the slaves to fight replication lag and you will use the same configuration except that you will have uh, traditional hard drives for, for the master. Um, backup and recovery. The typical mistake here is to focus on backup only. If you have a backup but you don't know how to restore it, it's useless. So you want to focus on how to restore your backup and not how to backup. And you have different needs. When you want to backup, you want you want it to be low impact because you're doing um, on the production machines. And if possible, it should be quick, but it's not necessary. When you want to restore your data, your your backup. Uh, you want it to be quick. If possible, uh, it should be low impact, but it's, it's not a problem. If your application is down and you want to restore a backup, well, the, 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 the main requirement is that it's quick. No problem if, that, if um, 
it uses 100% of your CPU or 100% or of your uh, I.O. capacity. So now, um, to, to have a good idea of the tool that you can use, you should, uh, you should know which, uh, which goal you have in terms of RPO and RTO. So the, the, the RPO is the recovery point objective, that is to say how much data can you lose, and the RTO is the recovery time objective, which means how much downtime can you afford. And the, the, the more relaxed the RPO and RTO are, uh, the more options to choose your tool you, you will have. Basically, when you want to choose how to make a backup, you will have to uh, choose between a logical backup, um, where you will end up with a text file, uh, which is very flexible, but which has the, the, the major drawback of, of being very uh, very slow to restore. Or you can have a raw backup, which, um, which basically consists in having uh, the binary files. Um, the, the, the good thing with the raw backups is that restoring uh, the raw backup is very fast. It's something like uh, copy the files to the, the MySQL data dir and start the server and, and it's done. But the problem is that uh, it's not obvious to do some operations like uh, restoring a single table or a single database. And of course, as it is um, a backup with binary files, you can have a corrupted backup uh, w without knowing it. Um, a few tools, MySQL dump, of course. So for small databases, it's very good because um, it's very flexible. The backups are fast, and the restores are not too slow. If you have a 10 gigabytes, uh, 10 gigabyte database, uh, maybe a, f a few minutes uh, is, is the time you will need to, to restore. It, it's good. For larger databases, it's not usable because uh, very quickly the restore time will be one hour, four hours, one day, etc., and it's not acceptable. If you want to have a um, an improved, a kind of improved MySQL dumps, you can have a look at MyDumper, um, which is um, a multi-threaded replacement for MySQL dump. Interesting project. If you want to uh, perform raw backups, um, extra backup from Percona is probably one of the best um, solution. So it has uh, an impressive list of uh, features, but I, you know, I won't go into the, the details here because we're, we're running a short of time, but it, it's really a, a very good solution. Um, last topic for today, instrumentation and monitoring. What, what, you, what you want in your, um, in your system is to have both a monitoring and alerting system and a graphing and trending system. So with the uh, monitoring and alerting system, you will be warned when uh, something is wrong. So for instance, uh, this is done with uh, Nagios or Zabbix. And when um, s s something has gone wrong, you want to have a trending solution uh, to identify why things uh, have gone so bad. So sometimes by looking at trends, you can see that, oh, your uh, CPU utilization is growing uh, by 10% per month. Of course, uh, in the next few months, you will have a problem. Okay, so when using a graphing solution, try to graph uh, everything you can to be able to see trends and to diagnose uh, the problems uh, as easily as possible. Inside MySQL, uh, you don't have as much instrumentation as you would need, but it's it's really improving. Um, uh, specifically with the, the performance schema, which is uh, which was new to MySQL 5.5 and really improved in MySQL 5.6. And of course, uh, you can use instrumentation uh, from your operating system. So, for instance, if you're on a, on a Linux or Unix, or something, you, you can use uh, tools like VMstat, IOStat, uh, Top, etc. Some other good tools are uh, InnoTop or some tools from the, the Procuna toolkit 
like uh, PT disk stats uh, that can give you some insight to um, in, of your uh, uh, I/O utilization. It's really good to know how to use uh, some of the tools to have real-time diagnostics. Um, I think I'm done. So before um, going to the, the question and answer, I will uh, remind you that um, in April we'll be running uh, um, the big MySQL uh, conference in uh, Santa Clara, California, and it's uh, a really good opportunity to uh, meet the community and uh, attend a real, um, really good session. So we, I, I encourage you to visit our website and. Uh, and register if you can uh, if you can be there. So um, now, Terry, uh, turn it over to you for the, the questions. Okay, very good. Thank you for uh, for the presentation. Uh, again, if uh, if anyone has a question, please submit them through the questions panel in the Go To Webinar Control Panel. Uh, so the first question we have is: uh, Can you configure an auto failover for promoting the slave and then making S two a slave of S one? Um, Yes, you, you you can have um, you can use a solution, for instance, like uh, PRM, um, which will automate um, the promotion of a slave. The key question here is to know um, if it's really beneficial. Um, for instance, if you have one master and two slaves, you probably you will probably have um, a crush of the master maybe once a year. And it's not easy to uh, to say if having an automated failover solution will be beneficial. In the opposite, if you have uh, 100 masters, well, of course, you will have one crash every week. So it can be interesting. So uh, really, um, automated failover versus manual failover, um, it, it's, it's really a tough question to know uh, which, which one to choose. Okay, uh, next question. Does Percona recommend a book slash Bible for tuning a MySQL setup? Well, um, y usually we, d we don't recommend that um, you, 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 you're using um, automated tools uh, to analyze your configuration. Um, because the good configuration um, is really dependent of your application, your data, your workload, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And sometimes you you can have an application where you have um, a different workload uh, during the day and at night. And sometimes y you will need um, to look for trade-offs uh, because you won't be able to have the best configuration for day and the best configuration for, for the night. And with automated tools, um, they will only tell you, okay, uh, raise the value. And it's not always true. So if possible, don't use um, automated tools. Okay, uh, next question. Uh, what are your thoughts on Galera clusters for HA? Does this provide meaningful and reliable master-master replication capabilities? Yeah, it, it's a, it's a really interesting solution. Um, of course, um, it it has uh, pros and cons uh, compared to uh, solutions like PRM or MHA or manual failover or even master-master replication, um, but it, it's really a solution uh, for which we, we, we are seeing a, a great momentum. So um, I, I really encourage you to, um, to look at it and try to install it. Um, yeah, it, it, can be, it can be really good. Okay. Um, I think we have time for one more question. Um, uh, when sizing types, medium, int, int, big int, etc., what is a good way to measure the memory usage and the savings by making it smaller? Well, it, it's it's not really easy, but um, what you can try to um, 
is to have an estimation such as um, if you're using a tiny int, it's one byte per value. If you're using um, a standard int integer, it's four bytes per value. So by using a tiny int, you're saving something like three bytes, three bytes per value. Let's say you have one billion rows. You, it, it's um, three three gigabytes. Okay, so it can translate uh, to three gigabytes of uh, disk space and three gigabytes of RAM for your uh, buffer pool, for instance. Of course, it's over. It's an oversimplified uh, calculation, but it can give you an idea. And sometimes when you uh, add up everything, so one byte here, three byte, he three bytes here, one byte here, um, multiplied by 100 million. Uh, you, you you can see real difference. Okay, very good. Well, that's the uh, end of the time we have available t for today. So again, we recorded today's webinar, and we'll send a an email with a link to the webinar recording and the slides used in today's presentation uh, within the next 24 hours. And uh, as Stefan mentioned, um, the Percona Live MySQL conference in Santa Clara is in April. Uh, super saver pricing ends for that on uh, January 20th, so there's just a few days left to get the uh, the lowest prices. So if you uh, can make it, it uh, promises to be a great event. Uh, Stefan, thanks for your uh, webinar today, and uh, everyone, please check our webinars page regularly. We have uh, a couple new webinars every month. Thank you. Have a good day.